thanks so much for coming to Bridging the Divide, Improving Mental Health Care Access and Delivery in Our Communities. My name is Erica Lake, and I'm the Medical and Academic Library Outreach Coordinator for Region 6 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine, and I'll be your host for today's session. We have just a couple of housekeeping items to cover before we get started. Everyone has been muted right now, but we do welcome your questions and comments in the chat at any time. Miles Dietz Castell, who's Region 6 Communications and Finance Coordinator, is providing technical assistance today, and he's going to be keeping an eye on the chat with me. Please be sure to select everyone from the drop down menu when posting your questions in chat to ensure both Miles and I see them. And we'll queue them up as they come in and save them for our speakers to address at the end of their presentation. Closed caption has been enabled, and that's available by clicking on the icon with the three dots at the bottom of your screen and then selecting closed caption. We're recording today's session, and we'll post it on NNLM's YouTube channel in one to two weeks. At that time, everyone who registered for this session will receive an email from us with the link for the recording. This class is eligible for one Medical Library Association continuing education credit, which you'll be able to claim through the evaluation link and enrollment code that we share with you at the end of the session. And speaking of that evaluation, your feedback really matters to us and helps us improve future training. So please take a moment to complete it. All right, since some of you might be first time attendees to one of our webinars, I'd like to just share a few words about who we are. NLM is the National Library of Medicine. It's one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health, and it's the world's largest biomedical library, producing online resources like PubMed and Midline Plus. NNLM is the network of the National Library of Medicine, and it's an outreach program of NLM, working to ensure that health professionals and the public health public have equal access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, four national centers, and three national offices, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. Region 6 includes the states of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. If you'd like to connect with your regional medical library or learn more about us, you can check out our website at nnlm.gov. So today's session was organized by Region 6 as part of our Speaker Spotlight series. This series features expert guest speakers presenting on topics of interest to all our users, which include librarians, public health practitioners, educators, clinicians, and others who work with health information. You can learn about upcoming sessions by subscribing to our Region 6 newsletter, checking out our blog, or by following us on Facebook and Twitter. In fact, you can join us on Twitter right now if you'd like, because Miles will live tweet during the session and share highlights and links to the information that's mentioned. All right, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our three speakers to for today's Speaker Spotlight. Dr. Nicole Del Castillo is at the University of Iowa, where she's the Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Carver College of Medicine, and a Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Del Castillo has been involved in various leadership positions locally in Illinois and Iowa, as well as nationally through the American Psychiatric Association and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists. Her research and health policy efforts have helped to shape, have helped to reduce disparities that prevent underserved populations from receiving needed health services by eliminating the barriers of stigma, enhancing education, and improving access. Dr. Shay Jorgensen is the medical director at Prairie Ridge Integrative Behavioral Health, which is a certified community behavioral health clinic in Northern Iowa. In addition to treating outpatients at Prairie Ridge, Dr. Jorgensen is the psychiatrist on the Assertive Community Treat Team and the First Episode Psychosis Team. She's also the Director of Rural Outreach and Training for the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics, where she directs the Rural Psychiatry Residency Track. And Dr. Kevo Rivera is a Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellow at University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics who identifies as a queer, agender, Filipinx-American child of once undocumented immigrants. 
Dr. Rivera serves through various organizational leadership positions at the local, state, and national levels as co-chair of the Department of Psychiatry Diversity Committee, as a counselor of the Iowa Psych Psychiatric Physician Society, and a diversity leadership fellow and member of the Council of on International Psychiatry and Global Health with the American Psychiatric Association. As an appointed member of the Iowa City Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they are also deeply invested in community level efforts to bring restorative justice to local marginalized and minoritized populations. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for presenting for us today. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I'll turn off my video and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and begin with the first part of our presentation, which will be highlighting uh, mental health disparities and social determinant, determinants or drivers of health. So can you all see my screen okay? We can see them. Perfect, all right. So I don't have any disclosures. Today, I'll be highlighting, kind of recalling mental health disparities, um, identifying why mental health disparities arise, especially as it relates to the social determinants of health, and then describing strategies to address mental health disparities. So we'll start off by, I like to give definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. So a uh, health disparity is a higher burden of illness, injury, disability, or mortality for one group compared to another or relative to another, where health care disparity or differences between groups as it relates to health insurance coverage, access to or use of care or quality of care. And ultimately, you know, our goal as health professionals is to really achieve health equity where everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. It's also important to, um, you know, oftentimes when we think about health disparities, we th think about it through the lens of race and ethnicity, but it's important to note that um, disparities occur across a broad range of dimensions, um, one's religion, gender, sexual identity, gender identity, age, ability, socioeconomic status, geographic location, language, citizenship status, and as we'll be talking about today, mental health, as well as other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. So I'm going to start off with a couple, you know, going over data as it relates to or information as it relates to, um, to disparities in mental health. So, you know, when we look at just overall health disparities or healthcare disparities um, for underserved and underrepresented populations, mental health is included in that. So mental health disparities, um, as we think about just, you know, just some of the general information, approximately 18% of uni United States or U.S. adults have a diagnosable mental health disorder in any given year. And approximately 4% of adults have a serious mental illness. Previous national surveys have demonstrated that the lifetime prevalence of mental illness in adolescents nears about 50%. And mental and behavioral disorders among or among the leading causes of disability in the United States, accounting for about 13.6% of all years of life lost to disability and premature death. However, among adults uh, with any mental illness and adolescents with uh, major, de major depressive disorders, less than 50% receive mental health services. As it relates to racial and ethnic uh, mental health disparities, Racial and ethnic historically minoritized groups are overall have um, similar, or in some cases, fewer mental disorders than white individuals. However, the consequences or disease burden of mental illness in minoritized populations may be, may be worse or in some case, longer lasting. So you look at some uh, certain populations or certain data, um, we can see that Asian Americans report higher levels of self-stigma. Latinx or Latino populations um, are likely to conceal potential mental um, health problems from coworkers or classmates. Um, Spanish uh, speaking individuals are the least likely group and some data has shown the least likely group to use mental health services. 
And racial and ethnic uh, minoritized populations are also significantly more likely to delay needed mental health care or drop out of mental health care services. And then looking at some of that data um, here as we look at um, the utilization rates of mental health services, you can see lower rates among Asian Americans, Latinx populations, African or Black Americans compared to white Americans. Um, data, certainly to mental health disparities among Black individuals, you can see overrepresentation in public mental health institutions or being involuntarily committed, an overdiagnosis of schizophrenia or intellectual disability or borderline intellectual disability. And as it relates to Black children with psychiatric care needs are more likely to enter, enter the juvenile justice system or receive care in residential treatment centers. So we look at some of the data as it relates to Alaska Native and um, American Indian populations, you can see higher rates as, it, as you look at the age adjusted de death rates, higher rates of alcoholism and suicide rates. For LGBTQ health disparities here you can see a list of um, health disparities and you can see here higher rates of suicide and other mental health issues amongst LGBTQ individuals uh, where there's more than twice as, twice as likely um, as heterosexual men or women to have a mental health disorder in their lifetime. LGBTQ plus individuals are also 2.5 times more likely to experience depression, anxiety, a substance misuse um, um, compared to heterosexual individuals. And um, as it relates to child mental health um, disparities, in 2000, Dr. David Satcher, who was the Assistant Secretary for Health and the Surgeon General, released a report called the National Action Agenda for Children's Mental Health. And at that time, the report noted that one out of 10 children and adolescents suffer from mental illness severe enough to cause impairment. And only about 21% of these children actually receive mental health services. So this is in 2000, and we can see still these stark disparities still exist today. So now let's get to why. Why do these disparities arise? Um, and overall, if we think about health disparities and, and why they arise, Dr. Kamara Jones, who is a past president of the American Public Health Association and a physician, came up with these three um, reasons why disparities arise. She noted differences in life opportunities, exposures and stressors, differences in the quality of care received, and differences in health access to health care. And oftentimes when I think of this, when I see this, it makes me think of the social determinants or social, social drivers of health that impact um, one's um, opportunity uh, for good health or quality of care and their access to care. So many of you might be familiar with the social determinants of health, which are, uh, you know, conditions in one's environment in which they are born, live, learn, work, play, worship that really affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. And as we see here in this um, figure, this diagram, you know, about 20% of what goes into one's health are impacted by, you know, the healthcare, or one's access or quality of care. Um, and then, you know, the other 30% are health behaviors like tobacco use, diet, exercise, 10% can be one's physical environment, and then 40% are the socioeconomic factors, such as one's education, job status, family and social support, income, and community safety. And if we look at this chart and we think about this, about 50% can be attributed to one's zip code and where they live, the socioeconomic factors and physical environment. But it's also important to note that there's not only these social determinants, but there's also these structural determinants or social drivers of health that also impact um, why disparities arise. So structural determinants or social drivers of health, um, this you know, diagram or this figure was um, created in 2010 by the Commission on Social Determinants of Health that was sort of set up by the World Health Organization. 
That is to show that there are how there the there are these social, economic, and political mechanisms, which are structures that give rise to a set of socioeconomic positions, whereby populations are stratified according to many factors, including their income, their education, their occupation, gender, um, and as we've been discussing, you know, other things. Um, such as um, the social determinants of health. And these socioeconomic positions in turn shape specific uh, determinants of health status, which are intermediary determinants, such as material circumstances, psychosocial factors, um, and these in turn impact the um, equity in health and well-being. If we look more specifically at mental health care disparities or mental health disparities, Dr. Satcher also in 2001 released another report called Mental Health, Culture, Race, and Ethnicity that explains some of the differences uh, between within minoritized groups as it relates to health disparities. And really, you can see that these are um, disparities and these causes are not just for racial and ethnic minoritized populations, but also for other groups and other populations, potentially like rural populations or um, other groups that have been marginalized more. Um, so some of these causes include increased risk um, for mental health disorders, less access to or availability of mental health services, less likely to receive needed mental health services, poor quality of mental health care, and the lack of diversity in mental health research. So I'd like to start off with a case um, before we go into breaking down some of those different causes. So this case here. So Alex, a black transgender woman with a mental illness who resides in a rural community. Alex needs to see a psychiatrist once a month for medication management and a psychologist or counselor every other week for help with coping with symptom management. And telemedicine options are not available for her community. Although Alex works full time and has medical insurance through her employer, there are no mental health professionals nearby because provider shortages that are common in rural areas. Alex needs to drive even further than other residents of her rural communities since she needs mental health providers who are accepting and knowledgeable about care for transgender individuals. To attend appointments, Alex will give will have to make multiple trips because her insurance does not permit two health appointments in one day, a common restriction in the United States. But the effect of this is compounded by the fact that she must travel long distances for scheduled appointments. Additionally, Alex lives and works in a rural area. Her efforts to get care are also complicated by the fact that her workplace insurance may be exempt from covering mental health benefits or may impose benefit limitations for mental health services. There may be additional employer or coverage policies as well as legal constraints that add barriers to accessing nece necessary care. This concerns Alex since her employer is unaware of her mental health history and her sexual gender or minority status. And Alex is worried about stigmatization and discrimination that she may face to both her employer, anyone in her community where we're to find out. Due to, her, to the smaller size of Alex's community, her absences will be noticed, which adds to her stress. Alex's path to wellness is affected by multiple dimensions, which each likely contribute to risk of poor health outcomes, some of which may combine in more additive, a more additive fashion. So as we go through these, you can think about this case and how these have been impacted in Alex's case. So, um, we see here some of these additional causes or risk for mental health disorders. Um, we can see that individuals who um, are in poverty or the lower social economic stat status are two to three times more likely to have a mental disorder. Racism, stigmatization, and discrimination are also stressful events and adversely affect health and mental health and cause or create uh, increased risk for mental health disorders for certain populations. 
as it relates to less access to or availability of mental health services and less likely to receive mental health services. We can see here for anyone with a mental health disorder that these are some of the barriers that they might see. So elevated cost of treatment, fragmentation of services, lack of availability of ser services and social stigma towards mental health. Um, or mental illness. And then um, for individuals from marginalized populations, you can see additional barriers such as mistrust or fear in the healthcare system, different cultural ideas about illness and health, lack of diversity of mental health providers, lack of culturally responsive or aware providers, differences in health seeking behaviors, language barriers, racism or other isms, um, varying rates of being uninsured, discrimination by individuals and institutions, and inadequate support for mental health services in a safety net setting. As it relates to poor quality of mental health care, we can see here that this chart really highlights how the quality and access to care differences and poor treatment is often more related to receiving less care or poor, poor quality care rather than their illness being inherently more severe or prevalent in a community. And some of these factors, as we've mentioned before, are cultural or linguistic barriers, but also some of the biases that providers might harbor. Some of you all might be familiar with implicit bias. There's a lot more conversation and, and awareness and training around implicit bias. But implicit bias are really these, refers to these attitudes, stereotypes, and mental shortcuts that can affect our understanding, actions, and decisions on an unconscious ba ba basis or barrier. And because of these biases, it can influence our daily interactions with patients, impact the patient clinical encounters, diagnosis and treatment recommendations, as well as outcomes and mortality rates. So in thinking about, you know, some of these reasons why these disparities arise, you've gotten some information about um, some of the data around some of these disparities, but here I'm going to highlight a few ways that we can eliminate some of these mental health care disparities and um, uh, my fellow um, additional speakers will also highlight other ways to as we work to try and eliminate um, these disparities. So I've highlighted some here. So improving the representation of individuals from diverse backgrounds and health and mental health care systems, improving cultural awareness, um, implicit bias training, and also increasing research and diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and service delivery issues to address disparities. And finally, um, I've been a big advocate of also co-locating treatment or mental health services uh, within different health services um, as another avenue to address um, these disparities. So now I will transition. I will, you know, sum up and we'll leave room at the end for, for any questions you all might have. All right, are we seeing my screen? Yes, yes. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Del Castillo. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevo. I'm a child adolescent psychiatry fellow at the University of Iowa, um, as um, Erica mentioned. And I'm really excited to talk about um, kind of how we take um, some of the concepts that Dr. Del Castillo had introduced, right? Um, kind of trying to um, address uh, disparities through increasing our culturally responsive and um, appropriate care um, to uh, um, uh, the patients that we serve um, in the mental health context. I um, was really um, motivated to learn more about this throughout my residency training because um, during my medical uh, school rotations, I was completing some um, uh, uh, global health um, um, projects uh, focusing on some of the local immigrant and refugee com uh, communities. Um, and we found that there was um, a lot of uh, access to health care for among uh, our Congolese populations. And one of the reasons um, why is because we just didn't really understand um, as a healthcare system um, what uh, some of the ways that we can break down some of the barriers were for that community. And so um, as I've gone in through my mental health care training, um, I, I've really tried to sort of inject that concept at, 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 um, through every step that I've gone through. Um, the, the basic outline of what I'll be presenting is I'm just trying to introduce um, 
uh, the history of how psychiatry as a profession has regarded culture um, and um, how um, we kind of see it today. And then I also want to introduce um, uh, and uh, help uh, folks familiarize themselves to some of the tools that the American Psychiatric Association have developed uh, and, and delivered through the DSM um, to help mental health care providers um, in their work to become more culturally responsive. So as I talk about culture, um, I want to kind of be clear that I'm not talking about any single um, social or demographic variable that might characterize an individual. Um, so it's not the same as someone's ethnicity or race or nationality. Um, and, you know, um, even though some people might ex uh, um, share some of those variables, um, a lot of the ways that they interpret culture for themselves uh, varies. Um, and, and culture does change over time uh, from generation to generation. So a lot of folks um, kind of regard culture as um, what is passed down from generation to generation as the first definition up top here is that whatever is socially uh, transmitted from um, the different social groups that you participate in and, and, and how they kind of pass those values and behaviors onto you. Um, I really like the definition of thinking about culture as an individual process where I am gathering from all of these different influences in my life and from there trying to figure out how I'm assigning meaning um, to my experiences and then um, build off of those to interact with the world in a meaningful way. Now, culture is also really difficult um, because if you kind of stop someone on the street and say, hey, what's your culture? They might be a little bit flummoxed and not have an immediate answer. And similarly, in clinical work, if I'm going to ask a patient directly, how does your culture impact your mental health? Um, some might not know how to answer that. And so there's other ways in which we can try to access that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so... Uh, I, I'm really into sort of this small community um, that kind of dubs themselves the cultural psychiatrists. Um, and uh, they really try to approach how culture impacts all areas of mental health, including research, including clinical care, including um, access and systems. Um, and uh, over time, that has, or, uh, at the very beginning of the psychiatric profession, that wasn't always the case. There weren't people who were paying attention to this. There was an understanding among, among psychiatrists that um, all patients are more alike than they are different. It's kind of a universal, uh, universal stance. Um, and then kind of mid-1900s, uh, there was um, a, a kind of a, a path towards um, thinking, hey, mental illness um, actually um, is socially defined. Um, so uh, different cultures will kind of say, hey, this behavior or this belief um, is um, not appropriate and uh, might represent some sort of illness. And that might vary from culture to culture. Um, there was a swing back to the universalistic stance um, where psychiatrists kind of doubled down um, and said, no, culture is, is just a set of confounding variables that impede our ability to understand psychiatric illness um, and approach them in a scientific manner. But as we've moved forward in time, now I like to sort of think about um, culturally responsive care um, taking a constructivist stance, meaning that we optimize our cross-cultural interactions um, through a dynamic process, process with our patients where they inform us, we inform them, and we try to build um, better bridges uh, between one another to improve our therapeutic alliance. Um, uh, it takes a lot of um, humility or cultural humility, and it takes a lot of curiosity on the part of the clinician to say, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I know everything about your culture, which, you know, I, I think um, a lot of times we think about as cultural competence. Um, but rather, I'm just going to ask you um, and, and relate to you uh, as we move forward in, in, in this uh, treatment um, so that we can um, help you get better. Um, culture presents in a lot of different ways in clinical practice um, for, for patients, um, you know, uh, I have a, uh, as an agender and Philippinex mental health care provider in Iowa, every interaction that I have in clinic is a cross-cultural interaction. And so you know, the way that I present myself and the way that I speak and the way that I express and the way that I dress and all of these different things are not the ways, um, are not the standard for a lot of the people that I'm interacting with. And so um, we have to make sure that we're, again, taking a cultural, um, hum uh, culturally humble stance and when assessing someone's mental status and making our observations um, that we're not um, identifying anything as pathologic um, if, uh, if it might represent a, a cultural variable um, for them. Um, it 
also for patients um, will impact how they understand or explain um, their illness experience. So a lot of patients will have an explanatory model that represents um, sort of a moral standard. Um, I, you know, I'm experiencing these symptoms because I did something wrong. Um, and, and, and other explanatory models include spiritual models, magical models, medical models, and psychosocial models, which is also pretty common um, among a lot of my patients. Oh, I'm only experiencing these things because um, this is the situation I'm in. This is the way that the community is around me, right? Um, and then culture can also influence how people seek help and where people seek help for their illness. So among certain cultures, there might be um, more of an um, influence to have people uh, seek care through primary care providers or um, a specialist or um, seek outpatient treatment first, um, or they might um, go straight to uh, an emergency department or seek in inpatient treatment. Um, and so uh, culture does have a lot of relevance in our clinical interactions. Luckily, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, which is now on its uh, the re revision of its fifth edition, um, has uh, introduced some tools that we can use um, as mental health care providers uh, to um, improve our cultural responsiveness with our patients. So um, there's a section in the DSM-5 um, that's called the cultural concepts of distress. In um, the DSM-4, um, this broad category was labeled um, cultural culture-bound syndromes, but they changed the definition um, uh, from syndromes to a broader array of cultural expressions of illness. Um, so for example, nervios, translated in nerves, um, among uh, Spanish-speaking and Latinx populations is an idiom of distress. It's, it's a way that they kind of just say, oh, I feel this way, right? Um, it's, but it's not necessarily a diagnosis or it's not necessarily an explanation for how they're feeling. Kufungisisa, um, uh, or translated to thinking too much um, in Zimbabwe, um, represents a type of cultural explanation. So um, because I'm thinking too much, that's why I'm experiencing anxiety and depression or physical health problems. Um, it can also be um, an idiom of uh, psychosocial distress saying, uh, I'm, you know, because of all of these things, I'm, I am thinking too much. Shenqing Shuairuo is weakness of the nervous system, which comes from the Chinese classification of mental disorders. Um, and so this is an example of a cultural syndrome. So, um, you know, uh, among um, a certain set of populations, they've uh, uh, observed and described um, a, a, a syndrome that encapsulates a whole host of symptoms, and they're kind of giving it a label in the same way that um, we um, uh, with the DSM have ascribed a label to major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder and what have you. Um, the DSM also, um, through um, its more standard sort of diagnostic um, uh, um, sections, will um, include some notes about culture for the clinician who's reading it. So um, for example, in the definition and description of panic disorder, it has a little note saying uh, cultural culture specific symptoms, um, tinnitus, neck soreness, headache, un uncontrol uncontrollable screaming or crying might also be seen as part of the complex of uh, uh, symptoms in panic disorder. But um, for the purposes of making a diagnosis, um, those shouldn't count as one of the four required symptoms to make the diagnosis. There's also other conditions or Z codes or um, other descriptions of distress that might become foci of clinical attention that the DSM lists. And so, for example, an acculturation difficulty or a religious or spiritual problem, it helps us name um, some certain things uh, that are um, impacting the patient and, and, and become uh, something that we want to um, help them through, uh, but might not necessarily neatly fit into um, some of the other diagnostic standards that we have. I fell in love with psychiatry because um, luckily I, I hopped on uh, when there was a better regard for some of the social context. Um, but uh, as I was training and learning in medical school, psychiatry um, was taught as, uh, as using a biopsychosocial formulation. So taking all of these different factors um, and helping us understand um, using all of those, um, uh, what um, sort of label or diagnosis would be appropriate. And, and then um, based on all of those factors, how can we proceed forward 
forward in our treatment and management. Um, so that's one kind of standard, most popular way of, of formulation in, in psychiatric, psychiatric practice. But the DSM also provides an outline for a cultural formulation. So a way for us to um, take uh, some different aspects of a patient's history and us, for us to organize them so we can have a better understanding of their cultural context and how that might be impacting their clinical care and our treatment relationship with them. Um, the cultural formulation interview, which is also included in the DSM, um, is a way for us to get all of that information for our formulation. Um, so the cultural formulation interview, the standard um, uh, version, uh, uses 16 different questions um, that are divided into four parts. So the first part would be the cultural definition of the problem. What brings you here today? Or how would you describe your problem that you're experiencing? How would you describe your problem to your family, friends, or other people in your community? And what troubles you most about your problem? In the next section, cultural perceptions of cause, context, and support, um, we have what do you think, why do you think this is happening to you? What do you think are, uh, the causes are? And what do others in your family, your friends or others in your community think is causing your problem? Are there any kinds of support that make your problem better? And are there any kind of stresses that make it worse? For you, what are the most important aspects of your background or identity? Are there any aspects of your background or identity that make a difference with your problem? And are there any aspects of your background or identity that are causing other concerns for you? Um, we ask too about um, the different culture factors, uh, cultural uh, factors that affect um, how a patient has um, coped or uh, sought help in the past. So what have you done on your own to cope with your problem in the past? What kinds of treatment, help, advice, or healing have you sought for your problem? And has anything prevented you from getting the help that you need? And then we kind of focus more on the present. Um, what kinds of help do you think would be the most useful to you at this time? Are there other kinds of help that your family, friends, or other people have suggested would be helpful for you at this time for your problem? And have you been concerned about any misunderstandings between you and me? And is there anything that we can do to provide you with the care that you need? Um, the CFI offers um, a number of different other versions. So there's an informant version if uh, the patient isn't able to sort of respond on their own. Um, and there's also um, other expansion modules that provide a whole host of other questions um, that can help in um, working with uh, specific populations, such as um, older adults, uh, adolescents, or immigrants and refugees. Um, there is research on the CFI saying that, um, showing that it is a feasible and acceptable um, in clinical practice. Um, and um, uh, among psychiatric residents and trainees, uh, it improves cultural competence um, for them. Um, and then others have a, a adapted the cultural formulation interview to apply it to even more specialized populations, such as uh, those in the military. Um, and then I also provided links here um, to uh, the CFI so that you can see it, um, the document firsthand and the supplemental, uh, supplementary modules. And if anyone is interested in doing their own online training um, with the CFI, I've included um, a version here at the bottom. There's also a lot of other resources um, to, to use to learn more about cultural psychiatry. And so I've listed those here. Um, and um, kind of bringing it back to some of the main points of this presentation, um, you know, we practice here in Iowa and um, a lot of people might not expect Iowa to be a very diverse place, but like its neighbors in the Midwest, it is home to an increasingly diverse population. Um, and so our culturally responsive practices um, can uh, be applied to like ethnic and racial minorities, um, and also to majority populations, um, but those who are still disadvantaged or marginalized um, by living in a rural area, for example. And without culturally responsive practices, um, we can't um, expand mental health services um, uh, adequately if we're not improving the cultural responsiveness of our care. Um, and in turn, that will help the accessibility of the care for the patients that we're serving. Thanks. Thank you both. I will get my slides pulled up here. So to finish our presentation out, um, I'm going to be a little bit more concrete 
about some specific things that are happening across the nation and one very specific model that's looking at addressing uh, where we have some inequities and some opportunities to really improve care, especially mental health care. And I'm gonna focus on rural communities because that's where I live and work, uh, but the CCBHC model is being applied nationwide, including in urban communities as well, but really meant to serve folks with uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. So a CCBHC it's, uh, stands for a Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. And that is the organization where I'm a medical director. Uh, we recently became a CCBHC. And so I've been learning this uh, throughout the last year during my time here. And the CCBHC model is put together by the National Council. And so some of these slides are directly taken from the National Council for Mental Wellbeing uh, because they do a great job explaining this model and how it's benefiting our patients. So it's a specifically designated clinic that receives flexible funding to expand the scope of mental health and substance use services available in communities to help ensure that populations are served equitably, equi equitably and have high quality care for underserved populations. So prior to the CCBHC model, there was really no standard definition for what a community mental health center did. Many of you might've heard of community mental, community mental health centers that exist and know that they serve underserved populations, but one community mental health center could have very different services and very different staffing um, and, and really you wouldn't know what one offers compared to another. And the other piece of that is there was no way to define how many community mental health centers there are across the country because there wasn't a defined a, a specific definition for what a community mental health center offered. And because there wasn't a standard definition, there also uh, was a, a challenge to try to get increased funding for something that we can't quite define what it is. So if those of you are familiar more with uh, federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, those would be sort of our, our equivalent, our physical health equivalent to what a CCBHC is for mental health. So the standard definition is really helping raise the bar for what we can do for service delivery. It's really modeled on evidence-based care. And so I'm gonna go through what some of the uh, requirements are to become a CCBHC, but all of the requirements are based off of evidence. And that's really what guarantees that we have effective clinical treatment for patients and their families. And the other piece of this is if you're funded as a CCBHC, you're required to present uh, quality reporting to uh, SAMHSA, the substance, um, the, the group that funds CCBHCs. Uh, I believe it stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Agency. Uh, it's in a later slide. Um, but that really ensures that we're accountable for the services we provide. And so, for instance, here um, in a rural area in northern Iowa, we don't have the ability to do that type of reporting as extensively as many agencies would with other resources. So we've partnered with the University of Iowa and we have a PhD working on our project as well as multiple research assistants to help us track the quality of data over the time that we, since we've started implementation up until now and going forward to ensure that we're really accountable for the funds we receive and improving um, really the lives of our patients. And it's different um, in terms of a payment system because most healthcare is fee for service where you, you, know, you get paid for the service you deliver. And unfortunately that doesn't serve patients well because oftentimes what we need is to be supportive for patients in other ways that aren't directly reimbursable. And so there's a prospective payment system and that helps covers the costs Cover, covering the cost for many other things that we otherwise wouldn't be reimbursed for. So in our agency, an example of that would be we have uh, four service navigators in our relatively small community and the service navigators are able to help patients really do anything that the patient needs, help connect them with um, housing applications or finding housing that's affordable, helping them apply for EBT um, so that they have uh, food assistance, helping people apply for energy assistance, helping them navigate setting up uh, physical health appointments. I could go on and on. They have a, a long list of all of the things that they'll help patients with. But those are things that typically, you know, we can't um, be reimbursed for. And so that oftentimes doesn't happen, even though those are the types of things that are really critical for taking care of patients. And so the prospective payment system allows for some of these more unique things to be covered. So I'm gonna get into the weeds a little bit because I think it will help you understand what a certified community behavioral health clinic does. And these are some of the, the specific definitions and criteria we have to meet to be a CCBHC. So there's certain staffing requirements, and I won't go into the details, but one of the major things is that they require a psychiatrist to be the medical director, and they have specific staffing ratios to make sure that we have the appropriate number of staff for the number of patients we're serving. 
they are very specific on availability and accessibility of services that we offer. And so one of the requirements is that we have outpatient hours that are at times necessary and required to serve our population. So that includes having outpatient hours in the evening and weekend times so that pe people who work during the day and aren't able to get off are able to access our clinic. It also includes providing transportation vouchers for people who aren't able to get here uh, with their own transportation. Uh, it, we serve people, we're required to serve people and do uh, via telehealth. So it can be ser serving them in their home via telehealth or some, some patients come to our outlying uh, outreach clinics in our really more urban or really more rural areas so that they can be seen uh, close to home rather than having to drive all the way to, to our main facility. There's also specific requirements around uh, crisis timing and um, uh, when, when we serve patients via, whether it's crisis or urgent or routine care. So if a patient presents in crisis, we're required to serve them immediately. And there's specific criteria that are involved in what's in, what, what we would call crisis. And then if it's um, an urgent patient, we're required to serve them within 10 days. And, and all, all patients actually have to be served within 10 days. And so if you're familiar much with getting mental health appointments to see, typically to see a psychiatrist or to see a therapist, oftentimes there's long wait lists, like months long. And here, because of this requirement, we have walk-in appointments that are accessible multiple times a week. Um, so people are able to get in within the week when they want services. It also requires us to serve people regardless of their ability to pay. And there's a sliding fee discount scale that's applied to people who are seeking service. So if uh, they don't have insurance, they can pay very minimally or not at all. And no individual is denied services because of the homelessness, which unfortunately frequently happens in other places because we need addresses um, in, in many clinics to be able to, to get them in a system. And, and, and we don't do that here. So care coordination is another requirement, and it includes coordinating care uh, with physical health along with mental health, but also with social services. Like I mentioned before, it requires that we coordinate services with housing, educational systems, employment opportunities, and it really helps address uh, treating the whole patient so that we're not just treating their depression or their anxiety. We're really looking at the, the entire picture and how we can help people in every way because we know that it's all of those facets of life that really affect someone's mental health and physical health. Uh, there are specific organizational authority requirements. Uh, I won't go into those details here. And then the scope of services um, are really wide. And this is the part that I think really makes this model unique and able to serve the populations in a very, very neat way compared to, to other clinic systems. So CCBHCs are required to uh, have certain things that are delivered within the actual agency themselves and some things that we're allowed to contract with other organizations. Um, they call that a DCO or designated collaborating or designated collaborating organization. And if you have a DCO in place, you have a specific contract with that facility that you contract that you're that you're partnering with. But ultimately, the CCBHC remains responsible to ensure that those um, types of services are offered in the DCO. Here in our CCBHC, we do almost all of it within our agency, um, but there are a couple of things that we do utilize outside resources for. So the things that are required to be delivered in the CCBHC is the ability to screen, assess, and diagnose patients, to have patient-centered treatment planning, and that's taken uh, really um, seriously in how we, how we write our treatment plans and how we talk about patients within our facility. It also requires that there's outpatient mental health and substance use disorder treatment. Um, the services are left a little bit broad um, and allow each facility to sort of pick and choose what evidence-based service they want to use um, as, long as, it is, as long as it does cover outpatient and substance use disorders. But some of the things that we do here in our agency is motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, we have an ACT team and a sort of community treatment team that treats people out in the community. Uh, we provide long acting injectables for patients who are in need of those. We, we provide uh, medication assisted treatment, which is actually one of the requirements of a CCBHC. So for people with opiate use disorders, they can seek treatment here. Um, and there's many other things we do, but those are some, some examples of our outpatient services. And then it also requires um, to be a CCBHC that you have crisis services, as I mentioned before, and a 24-hour mobile crisis stabilization team that can go out any time of the day to meet somebody in the community. Uh, and because we serve quite a rural population, uh, our requirement is within three hours, we need to be at that patient's home uh, with a team again at any time. The things that uh, don't have to be offered directly by the CCBHC but need to be offered in some way are peer support, 
psychiatric rehabilitation, which can take many different forms, um, targeted case management, uh, primary health primary health screening and monitoring, and service to veterans. And so you can either partner with a local VA or um, you can uh, serve veterans within your own facility, which is what we've uh, worked toward doing because we don't have a lot of services for veterans in our area for mental health or substance use disorders. So the payment model, again, I won't go into great detail with, um, but to just help you kind of wrap your mind around this, uh, it started with just a couple demonstration grants, 24 grants across the United States. And I believe that was around 2015 that those were initiated. And the idea then was just, let's try this model, let's try these requirements and let's track our outcomes and see what the results are. And the results were phenomenal. And so then they applied, um, they made the ability for us to apply for what's called a CCBHC expansion grant. And that has uh, widened this to many more facilities across the United States. And we were part of the expansion grant. And so as part of that, as our facility, we receive up to $2 million a year for up to two years. And then after that, there is an application process where you could, the next grant is for a million dollars per year for up to four years. And that, again, allows you as an agency to figure out what are the pieces that we need to become a CCBHC and what's going to take some funding to get started. And we can use those funds towards those things. So for us, some of that funding was to be used towards starting our sort of community treatment team. Um, we've also started a partnership with the local prison system to help uh, those who are discharging from prison to be able to receive care um, starting before they even discharge from prison. Um, there's a long list of things we've done that typically wouldn't be reimbursed, but are able to be funded through the grant while we get things up and going. So the status of participation in the CCBHC model across the United States you can see it's really almost everywhere except for these couple of gray states that don't have the CCBHC model implemented yet, but there's more than 500. Um, and you can see sort of by timeline where things started with the demonstration projects and then uh, became expansion grants. And then some states have statewide implementation where this state is also uh, funding some of the support for the CCBHC and not just SAMHSA. So uh, I'll go through just a couple of these um, outcomes and then we'll take questions, but the, the outcomes have been phenomenal. And the National Council for, one, months, the National Council for Mental Wellbeing has a success, success center on their website where you can read way more in depth about the various positive outcomes that have come about. Uh, but across the United States, there's been over 9,000 new staff positions and over an average of 41 new jobs per clinic, which is pretty typical. Like that's what our clinic has gone from. Um, about three to four years ago, we had around 75 employees, and now we have 140 employees. So we've almost doubled in the last uh, three to four years. They found increased retention and job satisfaction. And for me personally, I think that's a big part because I feel like I can address the needs of the patient. So otherwise, after a psychiatry visit, sometimes I'd say um, in a previous clinic where I would you know, assess someone and, and prescribe the medication, but notice that there's all of these other things that they need help with that we didn't have someone in the clinic to help. And I wouldn't have the time in my position nor the expertise to help people get all of those community resource needs met. And here I walk them literally just down the hall and I say, here's a service navigator. She'll be able to help you go through um, many of these needs. And, and I feel that we can really treat the patient as a whole, which makes my job so much more satisfying. Uh, it's allowed us to redesign care teams to meet the community needs. Um, there's been a wide increase in access to care. So over 1.5 million people receive care at CCBHCs, and that's a 17% increase in the number of patients that have been served. 89% of CCBHCs provide MAT, the medication-assisted treatment, and 60% of them are add have added that service due to the funding that CCBHCs add. 50% of CCBHCs provide same-day access, with 93% providing access within 10 days, which again is pretty remarkable uh, compared to many mental health clinics. And it's really allowed for innovations in care. So 75% of CCBHCs have been able to increase um, screening for unmet social needs, like housing, incomes, insurance status, transportation. And I would say for our clinic, that's something that we didn't screen for much before, in part because there wasn't a lot we could do about it. And so it would be frustrating to find all these unmet social needs that we didn't have the resources. And now that we have the resources, every single person that walks through our doors get screened for all of these things and then connected with the service navigator if they have unmet social needs. 79% coordinate with hospital systems, including 91% with crisis response to deflect admissions when appropriate. So working very closely with a local emergency department to help identify patients who don't necessarily need hospitalization, but need some support and care. 
And then last, it's funded some previously unfunded partnerships with the criminal justice system or carceral system, education, homelessness, and uh, hotlines like the 988 service that recently began. So overall, the, the model has been uh, really transformative for our agency, and it's something that has been really neat to see how it spread across the United States and impacted care. And so I just thought this was a great example of talking about how nationally we can affect change for some of our patients who otherwise wouldn't have access. I believe that's the end of all of our presentations. So we have just a handful of minutes left here to take any questions or comments that any of you might have. Oh, terrific. Thank you so much to all three of you. That was fantastic. Let's see um, if we've got any questions that have come in. While you were presenting, I'll see if Miles has any to. You know, while we're while we're waiting for some others to come in, I I have um, I don't know if it's really a question or <laughs> comment. Um, I'm just thinking about, for instance, at the University of Iowa, um, everybody who works here has received um, email lately about. Uh, training that we can take to recognize when individuals that we either work with or know in our personal lives are having some kind of mental health um, distress or issues. And um, now we have this training that's available for us to take in our free time um, and readily available to us. <laughs> and I know that there are other um, national um, training initiatives that are going on too, just trying to reach individuals so that they can do things one-on-one -on -one with others because we know that there's a shortage in mental health um, professionals that are available to help people. What do you think of those kind of programs and do you see a way of scaling them either further and reaching different communities in different ways? For me, one thing that comes to mind when you say that is um, there has been a lot here with agriculture because there is also a pretty high high rate of depression and suicide in uh, the farming population, which is much of the population we serve. And we know um, that people who work in agriculture are really, um, they, they don't seek out services for mental health care. And unfortunately, it's a bit, a bit of a taboo subject. Um, and so there has been a lot of training through extension offices. Um, and I know locally we've, we've seen people benefit from that. And I've had patients who have gone to talk to a friend or neighbor who have taken some of that similar training and then that their friend or neighbor, their fellow farmer who kind of gets it is able to say, you know, I've taken this training and, and you're at this level now where I recognize you really need help. And I've had people come through our doors that are really reluctant uh, to be here, but they've been told by someone that they trust that they need further services. So from my limited experience, I would say any of those trainings that help educate the public about mental health and how to how to help one another and how to um, receive services if they're, if it's indicated. I think there's so much stigma still with mental health that uh, people, you know, people go to who they trust and the more we can educate the people around them that they trust, I think that's a benefit for everybody. We do have one other question that just came in. Um, what recommendations do you have for patient advocates to help patients receive the services they need and support staff that may be reluctant to embrace cultural humility? That's a really good question. You know, I think that um, uh, we have a lot of folks in our community who really do want to provide um, like um, patient navigation or patient advocacy services um, uh, through ethnic community based organizations. And we definitely we just had a conversation with um, uh, someone yesterday about this. And, and we do invite um, patients to bring whoever they feel, feel like could serve as good um, activists for them or um, activists advocates in a setting that they're not comfortable in. And so we definitely welcome them. And um, I, a lot of the questions, for example, in that cultural formulation interview that I shared um, could be modified and kind of generalized so that even if you're feeling like someone um, is not really getting at uh, or asking you questions about um, kind of your cultural perspective um, or your, uh, someone that you're helping their their cultural perspective, you can at least try to use um, some of those um, items in the cultural formulation interview to kind of help communicate the specific needs and ideas that the patient has to whatever provider they're working with. 
Yeah, the only other thing I would maybe add to that too is just um, the importance of you know, building those relationships um, with individuals within different communities um, is so important. And I think, you know, a lot of times the navigators and so forth are from the communities where folks are from or familiar with those communities. So anytime there can be that bridging that gap or building community, building relationships with different communities is so important and so key. And um, as I mentioned, one of the things towards the end of my uh, presentation was that co-locating um, services or uh, within different communities, whatever that might be a school or whatever it is, community agency, whatever that might be to formulate some of those community or those, um, some of those uh, uh, partnerships or some of those ways that you can just um, build that trust within communities can be really impactful as well. All right, we're just about out of time. I am just going to um, share this information on the screen for any attendees that need to step out right at the top of the hour for the evaluation link and the enrollment code for the CE. And, and then I see Miles has put that evaluation link in the chat box for everyone. And we are at two o'clock. I, I again just want to extend my hearty thanks to all three of our pres uh, presenters today. Amazing uh, slides and and um, information that you shared with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.